Alright guys, welcome back to Data Crunch. Now today I'm very happy to host uh, one of our speakers at uh, DM Summit, Mr. Edmund Lee, uh, a data scientist from Micron Technologies Singapore. Now before we begin, maybe Edmund probably uh, can introduce yourself and tell us what you do. Sure, and thanks for inviting me to be here today, very uh, honour. And hi everyone, my name is Edmund Lee. So currently I'm working as a data scientist at Micron and helping the company towards smart manufacturing and AI because everyone is talking industry 4.0, right? So right now our company is working uh, towards this direction and our job as a data scientist in a team is to help this company to achieve their goals, things like that. Okay, sm AI, right? AI, right? Yeah. Yeah, this is what really <laughs> gets everybody attention. No matter yeah, what, I just put AI, you will, you, will, you, will, you will catch your attention. Now, on, on that, can you tell us a little bit more about smart manufacturing? What, what is it? How, how does uh, AI or machine learning be applied to that? Okay, I think at the end of the day, uh, what we are trying to achieve uh, in terms of smart manufacturing is to really reduce our business cost to automate as many things as possible okay. and also to reduce some of the repetitive and manual um, workforce, things like that, so that mm -hmm. we can replace it with uh, more intelligent and more automated fashion, you know, to try to uh, increase our revenue, things like that, and reduce the business cost. Okay, so the, actually today I mainly want to learn from Edmund not just about you know, machine learning algorithms and stuff, but uh, we, I know that Edmund, you are a very popular writer in, in medium, right? And <laughs> towards data science, okay? Uh, I, I wrote a little bit on towards data science also, and you wrote on Caddy Nuggets. Yeah, I, ever since my PhD time, I read on Caddy <laughs> Nuggets also. Yeah. Now, I always tell my students something is about building their portfolio, yes. right? It's easier for you to get noticed and then people will you know, hire you rather than you go and knock on people and say, hey, can I get a job from you? And of course, on the other hand, uh, getting recognized by the community as a opinion leader, not a KOL type, but key opinion leaders. And also the main intention from my end is that uh, most people, when, when they want to hire, especially in, in Malaysia, right, yeah. uh, the employer don't really know what, uh, they know what they want, especially yes. in the outcome automation, like what you say. But is that the same thing in Singapore, like the HR, what, what sort of environment is it over there? Uh, I think in general sense in Singapore right now, um, still some companies, they may not know what they are actually looking for, I mean, mm. in terms of the candidates, um, qualifications, some of the skills, things like that. That's why some of the times you may see some of the job description posted by Singapore companies yeah. is a long list of skills. Yeah, I, mean, I, I got uh, a feeling that they <laughs> copy paste. Yeah, from. exactly. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Okay. And um, but also some companies they they know exactly what they want because some of the job description may come from uh, their team mm -hmm. itself, so they know exactly what they are looking for and. That's why, uh, as a candidate myself, last time yeah. when I try to seek my uh, job things like job opportunities, I would try to sift through and try to filter out all these uh, job description and companies yeah. and to see to understand whether they are really looking for what they are looking for. Okay, yes. so uh, maybe you can give us a little bit of introduction about how is the data science landscape in in Singapore in that case. Especially, I would like to know more about. Uh, comparing, let's say, SME, MNCs, and also startups in terms of the adoption of data science and probably the culture of using data to make decisions. Okay, I would say that data science now is booming in Singapore. Just two years before, when I was still a physics student, I didn't know about data science, and it wasn't very popular in Singapore. And back then they talk about big data. And then, yes, exactly. <laughs> and then when I when I you know started going to this field. This term really started getting traction yep. from different industries or even government itself. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, Singapore yeah. right now, they are, if you are not uh, aware of this, Singapore right now, they are pushing towards smart nation. Okay. Okay, so smart nation comes with data and technology, all this stuff. They try to combine data, uh, science, things like that, and other technology to really empower their citizens, you know, to really do a uh, better job, things like that, yep. to really improve their, their lifestyle, etc. So to come back to your question, right, the comparison among SME or maybe medium size or maybe some MNC companies mm. in terms of the data science landscape. I think especially startup, they are increasingly using data science or even a lot of AI startups right now in Singapore. They are booming in Singapore because they are getting a lot of grants, a lot of VC funding from uh, Singapore okay, government. Okay. Some investors. I think startups, startups sort of have the mentality yeah. that they, they use data, <laughs> data AI, AI since day one, right? Even yes. though I'm, I'm not saying that 
all startups don't know what is AI mm-hmm. machine learning, but even if they don't know, they will have the mindset to use that and be ready for that since yes. day one, right? Okay. Yes. In order to get you know funding things like that. Yeah. But even MNC, for example, uh, at Micron yep. or itself, uh, our our management, upper management, they are trying to you know uh, put in more more and more money into this field to mm-hmm. really improve the manufacturing process, and we can see the progress. Yeah. So I think the landscape right now is booming, and I think the growth is really outstanding. And I really foresee in the future, maybe for the next few years, uh, data science will be more and more um, applied to. Uh, Many other peoples. Okay, now in terms of that, let's say uh, a lot of our audience that actually, uh, like I mentioned to you earlier, they either they are, they are either graduates like fresh grads like uh, university graduates, they are trying to enter data science as a as a career, yep. or on the other hand, there are some people they are in their their mid of their career, thirty over years or forty years, so they are trying to switch career to make a progression in in data, right, a data career. So what what the other types? What are the job markets like in Singapore? What are the different types of data? Uh, positions available? I think uh, right now in Singapore, there are two types here. When a company is looking for data science candidates, either they require someone very technical and experienced into this field, yep. or they maybe just require someone very uh, a generic role, whereby okay. you can just apply some uh, normal machine learning model, some data analytics, and so then they will oh, yeah, okay. get you in, things like yeah, that. Yeah, very analytical yes, kind of person. Yes. Okay. And there, there's another one, it's a very research-based. They use a lot of cutting-edge uh, machine learning models. So those usually are, are they employ PhD at least okay. candidates that have really some research interest and really skills. Okay, so those are the, the basic type of jobs. So for example, uh, you talk about AI. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Um, in, in MNC, I don't, I don't foresee that will happen in SME so soon, but in okay. MNC, let's say if they adopt AI, what type of jobs usually will AI replace? I think uh, the first thing that comes to my mind when yeah. I heard your question, I think it's uh, manual work, whereby yeah. this manual work uh, will be replaced by AI, for example, uh, in manufacturing yeah. sense. Uh, we have a lot of processes that need to be run by our uh, some other co-workers, technicians, things like that. So maybe in future, this manual work or repetitive task can be or could be replaced by AI when they really implement this. In, in their so, so am I right to say that AI is just a broad terms of uh, advanced technology? Because even if we take the word AI apart, they yes. still need to be replaced by robotics, mm-hmm. you know, or those mach- mechanical arms, for example, right? And uh, but if we take it to the, the second layer or the second level is that we ultimately want to reduce uh, manual errors and we want to save our costs as a company, yes. right? Now, let's go back to the, the topic, right? So, if you were to give the two words here <laughs> to the audience, what yes. should they do when they want to become a data scientist or prepare themselves to enter data science? Let's go back to the, the topic, right? So, if you were to give the two words here <laughs> to the audience, what yes. should they do when they want to become a data scientist or prepare themselves to enter data science? Stand out. Stand out. Stand out, yes. There's nothing more than standing out. You have to be special. Now, I'm going to give you a, a bit of a teaser <laughs> is that if you want to know the entire thing about how to stand out as a data scientist, you've got to you know, uh, join our uh, DM <laughs> yes. Summit. But maybe Emma, uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, from the other side, right? How, what makes you think that standing out is so important, especially as a data scientist? Okay, so this came to my personal experience. Mm-hmm. When I first started out in data science, I just I was just like normal other people, like kept standing out uh, my resume mm-hmm. to different companies, uh, different job portals, things like that. But at the end of the day, I realized that even though I, I did my best to polish my resume to stand out the best of best to other companies, I still didn't get any response or even interview offers. Uh, not even a call, Not right? even a call, right? Yeah, yeah. Not even an email, okay? And that was the point where I realized this is something wrong. Okay. I got to use a different approach okay. instead of the conventional one. And then I started realizing actually personal brand could be applied to job searching. And if you apply it right, at the right place, at the right time, consistently, all right, 
actually the ROI is tremendously high to really help you boost your job search career, things like that. Okay. To land a job that you want. Yep, yeah, yeah. So from from your experience, right, what what are the types of let's say uh let's talk about the tools first. What yep. are the tools that you use to uh, build your personal branding? Okay, there are two main uh, social media channels, right? Yep. The tools that I use to build my personal brand. First one, LinkedIn. Second one, Medium. Medium is a platform uh, for people to write articles and publish it on different publications. Okay. So I use Medium as the main platform to publish my articles where I share my learning experience, my mistakes, my takeaway yeah, with others. Okay, what about uh, LinkedIn? Like a, a lot of people, if you, you, know, if you follow yeah. Gary Vee, they, they have been talking about <laughs> yeah. LinkedIn is the, is the next big thing. Although LinkedIn has yeah. been there for, for so many years, but what, what, what is your take? Like why suddenly LinkedIn becomes so... Um, I don't know, popular, and yes. then uh, why, why is it especially important for, for data scientists or data science practitioners? I think LinkedIn recently, they started getting all these, you know, comment, you have to focus on LinkedIn, build your audience, yeah, yeah. things like that, right? Yeah. Um, they started realizing this LinkedIn stuff is actually a content creation platform, and you have to start doing this right now. Previously, because people thought of LinkedIn as just a job search platform, okay. it's another job street, for, exa- for example, right? So right now, I think um, how LinkedIn works is uh, for me, myself, to build my personal brand is to put out content to help other people mm. in data science field, how to go into this field, to share my knowledge, share my expertise, to really build my audience slowly, okay. all right? And to sh- really share add values to others before you ask for anything, for example, ask for a job. On LinkedIn, you can't just approach someone, hey, can you recommend me to this job? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. yeah. Can you, can you, can you, can you, uh, can you refer, refer me to, me the, to yeah, this to, job? To the HR. Yeah, this yeah. doesn't work this way, right? And this is how, you know, putting out content consistently and to build your personal brand works together. Okay, so this is a give and take, right? Yes. Give value first. And mm-hmm. I believe that LinkedIn finally, finally lives up to its name of the Facebook for professional. Yep. Okay, finally, <laughs> after so many years, like ever yep. since before. Now, um, is there any other things that we can do apart from LinkedIn uh, providing content? Mm-hmm. Um, and like, for example, any physical activities like joining hackathons or, or meetups? Does that help too? It does, it does. Especially, uh, I would highly recommend you to join hackathons and meetups. Mm. So, for example, hackathon, uh, maybe around your region, you realize there are some data science hackathons going on or yeah, maybe yeah. developing some machine learning models. Maybe this company, they have a problem to solve. For yeah. example, Shopee, they, have, they want you to solve a problem Then they organize this hackathon. And this is a chance for you to get into this, to really uh, build your own portfolio. Or what if, if you win this hackathon, maybe you get a job opportunities from Shopee, right? Okay, and for, for me, for right? Me, yeah. from, for me, when I choose a hackathon, <laughs> I only look at the grand prize money. That's, that's yeah, yeah, the yeah, way. Yeah. Now, yeah. Is there any other tips that you can give our audience? Like, how do you choose? Okay, in, in KL, right, mm-hmm. we have a lot of meetup, meetups, right? Every, every day, every, every night, we got meetups. So the, the way that we choose this is based on the food that's given. Mm-hmm. Okay, we have pizza, <laughs> yeah. berry oh, cool. sponsor. So that's, that's how we, we choose mm-hmm. it. Me, okay, how, how me choose. Is there any tips that you can give our audience? Is that how do they choose the right hackathons and uh, meetups to attend? Okay, right, let's talk about the meetup first. Uh, for me personally, how I choose uh, what meetups for me to attend is to see what topics they are presenting on that day, the mm-hmm. main team, and also what speakers they are inviting to come over. Mm-hmm. So, for some of these speakers are highly experienced in a particular field, I will really be interested in speaking or maybe meeting this speaker to learn more about him yep. or her. Right, then I'll sign up and um, also during the meetup itself, it's the time for you to network. Don't just sit there, right? Don't just yeah. sit there and listen. It's for you to shine, to network, to build relationships with others. And don't just give your name card during meetup. You need to really share your knowledge and really listen to others. Being a listener is a good, it's a very best way for me to really network with other people. Yeah, mm-hmm. okay. so yeah I think I think that, that applies to me. So most of the time I just sit there and now for the meetup organizer, so this is something that they can learn, right? Don't just get the speakers because the speakers mm. are available during that particular time, but you try to gather speakers around a, a team so that they know what each other is talking about yep. and then the speakers themselves can have better synergies. And it is from my experience as a speaker as well. Yep. Now, uh, and uh, one thing that you talk about is that uh, actively writing on Medium. Now, I'm going to test your memory. How many <laughs> articles you have written on Medium so far? Wow, this is... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just back let, let me recall. I think uh, I started writing Medium articles uh, uh, since last year, yep. I think it's been a one and a half year now. Okay. Uh, I think uh, because uh, previously when I started for the first few months, I didn't write uh, consistently, yep. like posting every week. 
I started posting consistently a few months ago. I think it should be around 30 or 40. Thousand. No, no, no. 30 articles or 40 Oh, okay, articles. okay. Articles. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I was thinking about your followers. Oh, I, no. I remember, you followers? Have, <laughs> I remember you have uh, 11 over 1,000 followers on LinkedIn. Oh, uh, right? yes. And what about Medium? Almost uh, 3K because uh, it's one of my goals. Uh. Okay. I, the goal of this year for me is to hit up to 3K. 3K. Uh, um, I, okay. As a, as a writer myself, right, uh, we always hear people talk about uh, it's better that you write and publish consistently mm. rather than, you know, when you get the kick, you write 10 articles at one go and then when you don't have a kick, you sleep. Yes. Sleep as in SLIP, you sleep away for, for, <laughs> for a few months. Yes. Uh, what, what are the major differences when it comes to like personal branding, let's say, right? After writing it consistently, what are the major impact or significance that you have seen? The major, the huge impact for me mm. is um, the first time I got invited to speak at DBS Bank, by one of the meetups to share my story. DBS Bank is in the Singapore Development yes, Bank. Wow. Yes. So they found, uh, they, they connect with me on LinkedIn, some of them, and then they found me on um, my medium articles. And uh, this is also one of the reasons why I got invited for my second uh, speaking gig uh, uh, with NUS for their workshop, things like that. I think one of the mediums, how it works is, uh, it doesn't matter how many articles uh, that you publish, but if you publish it as long as consistently, and people start getting noticed, you know, things like that. The content that you put out are useful to them. And your personal branding is starting getting built and built and built. This is how you get noticed. And I think uh, Medium has helped me a lot in terms of my career to really build my portfolio and to share my experience with others. Okay, so actually that's the next thing I was about to ask you also. So how, how has writing in general helped you as a data scientist? Not so much about on Medium, right? That's to, to grow, that's your personal branding. But in terms of a data scientist itself, like uh, did writing help you to in, uh, articulate your ideas or what are the other, uh, your, your skin becomes smoother, your, yes. your brain becomes faster, that sort of thing, <laughs> that sort of benefits. Yeah. I think the first, uh, the first one is Medium helps me improve my communication skill. Yeah. You know, as a data scientist, you have to communicate our ideas, our finding, our results, yep. right, to our stakeholders. So if we are not able to convey this message uh, correctly, right, the concept, I think uh, it doesn't matter how good your insights are. That's why I try to really polish my communication skills in terms of writing and thinking process. Yeah. Because when I have, for example, I have a solution that I built for my personal project, I need to really uh, articulate the whole project from end to end yeah. to really share with others what is it that I'm doing, why it matters to them, things like that. And we, and we hate yes. writing documentation. <laughs> <laughs> documentation is also important. I also wrote that article. So. Yeah. I think Medium has really helped in terms of uh, communication skills and also in terms of um, to really uh, polishing your thinking process, the logical thinking flow, mm. how you're going to convey your message to others in a very conversational manner so that people will get attracted to what you have to say. Yeah, and then people making people really want to read yes. and they, they not to say buy your idea, but they, the reading itself is, is a very yes. important step, right? Okay, now, uh, here comes to the end of our Data Crunch episode today and thank you very much, Edmund, for joining us. Uh, as, as usual, right, you, when we usually close our episode, is there any advice for our, our audience that who wants to really get into data science and especially uh, what, what are your advice for them in terms of personal branding? Okay, don't be a lone wolf. What I mean is uh, we have a strong data science community all right, on different social media platforms. So you can focus one platform first to build your social uh, personal branding. For example, LinkedIn, this is what I focus on. right? So I build my personal brand on there and I try to connect with as many data science people as possible. We, we have a strong community whereby we share our knowledge and to help others and to learn at the same time. So I think this is one of the best ways for you to learn, to network, to share, and to get connected with so many people at once. To really boost your career, yeah. Yeah, and, and also that's how we met, right? Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, as usual, if you like this video, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click like on our page. And uh, if you want to know more about uh, Edmund's journey to become a data scientist and a lot of his other tips, don't forget to uh, join our DM submit, uh, the link here. And of course, don't forget to follow Edmund on LinkedIn and visit his Medium page as well. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next episode. See you.